dare to defy? What's the return on investment? Hi, Jose, Scott, Christian. It's good to have you here today. Um, so the topic is about DeFi, decentralized finance. I mean, quite a big buzzword uh, these days. So we are going to try to go a bit all around the topic. And uh, just for those that may not really be aware about what decentralized finance means, uh, maybe Jose, you, you would like to start by let us, uh, giving us an overview about uh, what is DeFi exactly. Yeah, sure. So um, decentralized finance, there's, there's, there's a couple of different definitions, but I think ultimately um, it's financial infrastructure that's owned by internet users. That was kind of the, the best definition I saw on Twitter the other day. So a lot of finance is, is middleman. So it's, it's kind of connecting supply of capital with, with demand for capital in various different ways. Um, that's normally done by, by large institutions that, that we call banks or insurance companies or, or whatever else. And with crypto, it's kind of replacing that with um, crypto economic incentives that allow um, you know, a ne network of kind of disparate actors all around the world to provide, to collectively provide these services that were previously being provided by centralized institutions. Okay, good. Thank you very much. And uh, Scott, maybe you want to let us know a little bit more about what has been the evolution uh, of decentralized finance and why all of a sudden it's such uh, the buzzword of 2020. Yeah, great question. I think there's, there's many reasons why. Um, if you look at like decentralized finance being in the simple sense, basically merging um, the emergence of traditional banking services with um, decentralized technologies and DeFi really having the potential to um, replace existing financial services um, with the add-on of decentralization. Mm -hmm. And there's many, there's many ex ex um, advantages of that. Um, so like DeFi apps don't require any intermediaries and therefore don't need any um, arbitration from any third parties, um, removing counterparty risk, that being one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. Smart contracts with these DeFi protocols, they revolve, um, sorry, resolve all possible disputes and users control their own funds. So I think that's really crucial to what's happening in DeFi. You're not reliant on a third party or an institution. You hold your own funds all the time and your own, your, your own custodial. Um, all these things are actually reducing uh, the cost of providing that service and um, just being a more transparent system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think now it represents something like 9 billion US dollar, if I'm not mistaken. I saw something recently. So, I mean, it's quite a big jump compared to what it used to be. And uh, Christian, would you like to let us know uh, a little bit about, I mean, what from your view are the main advantages of DeFi and what have been the best application or use cases you've seen uh, in the last couple of months? Yeah, I think from my perspective, a lot of the advantages have been about DeFi being somewhat permissionless. I also think that there's been a lot of interesting developments because it's been so experimental. And so developers are able to iterate quickly and build quickly so that they can present something new to the community. And then the community can start to analyze whether there's any value associated with that project. And so I think we've seen uh, a lot of interesting vegetable named projects lately in DeFi, um, as well as other food token types. And so I think that's mostly what I've been paying attention to. And I think it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would you see as the limits to decentralized finance? Yeah, so I think in terms of the limits, it's very much within that nature too. I would maybe point two things out. It's been very experimental and very circular. And so when I say experimental, I, I mean that it's somewhat like the Wild West. So sometimes projects are building so quickly that they forego an audit or they'll just uh, launch very quickly without having a gradual release of the project to make uh, sure that funds are OK. And so I think this is OK. Uh, but over time, there is going to be, I think, a major risk and some funds might be drained from a specific project. But I think people have forgotten what that's like for a couple of years now. And on the point around it being circular, it's just that a lot of projects are integrating with each other to essentially have funds go in a circle and they're not really building for mainstream DeFi. And so I think they need to build out from the current user base that exists today within DeFi. And we see many people are actually mistaking uh, open banking and open finance, uh, which is DeFi. Um, could you highlight the main different, uh, differences between both? Any of you three? <laughs> Yeah, uh, so I mean, uh, the difference between open banking and DeFi, um, open banking, like as we're quite familiar, it's pretty predominant in, in Europe, um, London being 
one of the havens for open banking um, with lots of like the new fintech companies utilizing that to essentially uh, open up and enable different uh, startups, et cetera, to, to build financial services. Uh, I think that's different from DeFi where that's really your uh, trusting in an entity. You're still trusting in a group of intermediaries or an institution in the background. Um, what's happening with DeFi is you, it's really peer-to-peer -peer or now moving more into peer-to-contract. So you're trusting in the code, you're trusting in essentially a smart contract. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, each of you, if just you had, that. sorry, Jose. Just to add to that quickly, I think another, the, that, that was a great explanation. I think another of the big differences between sort of DeFi and open banking and kind of between crypto and, and all its competitors is just the permissionlessness, you know, where these are, where whereas money and lending and all these primitives normally are sort of um, closed databases, very permission databases that you need certain licenses to, to access, crypto transform them, transforms them into sort of open primitives that anyone can compose together to build new applications and that anyone can access. And I think sort of the innovation that that unlocks is what we're seeing now with all the kind of vegetable and, and food um, named coins, but also with, with, with a lot of other cool stuff that, that's happening. And the, the innovation, you even see it with like the centralized, some of the centralized products that are building on top of crypto, like Binance, right? And, and, and others, they're launching sort of the, their product release cycle is so much faster than the, than the fintech incumbents. And obviously the fintech incumbents is even faster than the banks. But when money is an, is, is an open API, like, you know, Binance launched sort of six new products last year, you know, from futures to options to, it's just, an, it's just unseen in, in, in fintech previously. And I think that's the real power of, of, of this technology. Mm -hmm. Good. And uh, Christian, if you had to choose and highlight only three, like the three most promising uh, DeFi platforms, which one would it be? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I mean, I would probably make it easier on myself and probably pick some of the projects that already have a lot of value locked within them. Yeah. And so I would maybe think of something like Aave, uh, Curve Finance. And I mean, I personally do like Uniswap and Synthetic. So I'm a little torn on, on what I would pick there, but I think they both have their merits and they're a little bit different in what they offer. And so I think for me, I'm perhaps a little bit more interested on the automate, automated ma uh, market maker side of mm -hmm. things. So I would reference both Uniswap and Curve there. But I think the world of synthetics is very interesting. And so projects like Synthetic or Uma Protocol are building something that can capture a lot of value over time. And so I think these are the types of projects people can start to pay attention to if they're not already. Okay, Scott, what would be your three picks? Yeah, um, definitely definitely going down the decentralized exchanges, automated market maker route, um, like Curve and uh, Yield Finance are two really interesting projects. Actually, and um, back to your point about Uniswap, uh, I saw that Hayden Adams, the creator of Uniswap, just announced yesterday on Twitter that um, their 24-hour trading volume just exceeded Coinbase for the very first time. So we're seeing these automated market makers like really enabling a place where they can connect buyers and sellers together without having that like i guess intermediary in place or centralized um aspect in place i think that's that's going to grow and keep growing tremendously jose yeah. what would be your three favorite ones yeah i think for me there's, there's kind of a, a separation between um projects that i think are going to grow a lot and add create massive value and projects that i think can capture it and I think there's, there's sort of a subtle difference there where with, for instance, AMMs, um, I think AMMs will continue to, to grow like, like very fast. You know, we've already seen Curve become cheaper than, than centralized exchanges for transacting stable coins. Um, we, we've seen one inch at, at times do that, uh, you know, when you, when you, at least for big transactions because of gas costs. I think that'll continue to happen. I think the issue is how can they capture value? Because with AMMs, th this is open, and with crypto generally, this is open infrastructure. So the, the liquidity is a moat because it gives you better execution. So it, it allows you to to um, to beat your competitors. But once you start charging a fee on top and trying to capture some of that value, you're detracting directly from your moat, you know? And, and liquidity is kind of, it, it's undifferentiated supply. Like, you know, most traders don't care what UI they use. They care about best execution. So I'm quite interested to see how AMMs actually end up capturing value. And for me, it has to be differentiation on the supply side. So providing a unique, because if, if the traders aren't the customer, then your customer is, is your limited, is your, um, is your liquidity provider. And, and I think that it, platforms that give a great experience to, to LPs are the ones that are gonna win. So I'm really like Balancer, 
Um, and then the disclaimer, sort of as a, as a fund, we own both both Rune and, and Nexus Mutual, and those are the two others I'd, I'd talk about where Rune, you know, building sort of cross-chain AMM architecture with a token model that makes sense. You know, we've seen um, how Curve can drive stable coins to be cheaper than centralized exchanges. I think Rune will show that that can happen for, for a pair like Bitcoin USDT as well, you know, and it's, that's a huge use case. It has more volume than, than all of Ethereum, um, you know, the 24-hour volume. And then NXM, Nexus Mutual for me, decentralized smart contract insurance. You know, there's nine billion, as you mentioned, locked up in DeFi right now, and there's less than less than 0.5 percent of that is currently insured. And I think for the for the space to grow, um, as as I think Christian said, people have forgotten about the hacks. They've forgotten about the DAO hack, but it's only a matter of time until one of these food coins gets hacked. And and I think that the the percentage that of of TVL that's insured will keep going up. Nexus is the only game in town for that. It's really well designed token economics. So yeah, I'd I'd go for those two with the disclaimer that that I own them uh, and it's not financial advice, obviously. Mm, okay, and uh, well, Christian, um, another one for you. Uh, I mean, basically, like for ICO, what happens? And a lot of countries obviously wanted to regulate it. Um, do you think DeFi is going to need some kind of legislation uh, to be adopted more by by the masses? Or will we see some kind of autonomous organizations who are going to uh, to use autonomous systems uh, as to be able to make those assets uh, available to everyone? And that, yeah, that's I mean, the technology I, as well enable it to be regulated. Right. I, I think that that's what's difficult. I think to the most extent, quality projects today have tried to self-regulate to the extent that they can to operate in good faith. But these protocols are obviously permissionless, and we've seen projects like Compound uh, start to gradually and almost entirely hand over control to the community. And once that happens, it's a little bit more difficult for a regulator to come in and point fingers. To some extent, they can, and I fully expect regulators to say, you know, hey, what are you doing? How do we stop this? And, and dig a little bit more into it. But I think over time, we are building the frameworks for organizations to essentially be able to uh, govern themselves without any centralized party, whether that's uh, some kind of entity like Aragon building uh, DAO kind of infrastructure. Uh, it's all being built out. And so I think it's only be going to become more difficult over time. But I'll let anyone else uh, uh, chime in, too, if they have any thoughts. Mm -hmm. On the Just on the touching on quickly on the regulation question, I think that the, um, the, the ideal scenario for me there is that you have some of these decentralized protocols acting as the infrastructure and then you have like some centralized user interfaces that are regulated and that actually bring this to the masses, you know, with, with the protocols being the infrastructure that they use on the back end. Um, I think that would be the optimal kind of scenario and I think the, the centralized entities will be regulated. I think it'll be very difficult to regulate some of these protocols just because of, of how they're built, how decentralized they are. Um, how many sort of legal issues that they bring up, but I think that the government will, will definitely try. Governments around the world will definitely try, especially when you're talking about AMMs and, and, and transferring money without KYC and, and all that. It touches a lot of um, very sensitive, you know, anti-terrorist, um, anti-money laundry regulations that, that are also there for a reason. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, how, how it plays out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and do you think, I mean, we're going to be able to kind of leverage those limits? It's not going to be a break to to being adopted that DeFi is being adopted by uh, much more entities. Um, yeah, from from my perspective, I don't think so. I think the the sort of game theory of it is that countries that ban it uh, miss out on the innovation that it unlocks, and and all that you know flows to to another country. So I don't obviously someone like the U.S. taking a very um, negative stand against it would be would be bearish for the for, for the industry and for innovation, especially given how much comes out of there. But I'm I'm kind of um, hopeful, especially given the the changes we've seen recently, like to the accredited investor rules. You know, letting people um, not have to not not just the rich get richer, but you can actually prove that you know enough to be an accredited investor as well. Hopeful that there can be a, an innovation sandbox or some regulation that on on the centralized company side that makes sense. But um, yeah, I'll let the others ch chime in there as well. Okay. Yeah, I think maybe I would add that. Um, you know, to some extent, we've seen some teams already build somewhat pseudo anonymously. And so this might be something that would grow over time if countries were to take a more negative stance against um, these these kind of protocols. And so I think one example has been there's been a resurface of basis, the kind of stable coin idea that 
uh, previously uh, returned money to investors after it deemed that it couldn't really operate in this regulatory environment and seems like that's resurfaced with a pseudo anonymous team and so I'm interesting to see how that plays out. Okay, and uh, we are running out of time now. So just the last uh, question uh, would be about the evolution of, of DeFi and uh, do you think it's going to be overcoming all its limits and just uh, ensuring that we don't replicate a second DAO case scenario? Yeah, may maybe I can start off. Um, I think I referenced you know, so some of the limits related to it being experimental and, and circular a bit. Uh, I think that, you know, we've talked about there being a second DAO case scenario, and I think that will happen. Ultimately, I hope the community learns from that and kind of continues to grow from it. But I know there are entities already that are starting to tackle some of these issues. I think one is fair launch capital in the sense that they want to provide projects the ability to provide an audit and launch with a little bit of more security and ultimately have that team paid forward to the next project that would do it. And so I think DeFi has shown its ability to overcome some of the limits already, and uh, I have no concerns about it being able to adapt over the long run. Okay. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think um, adaptability is, is something really crucial in DeFi and, and it's happening tremendously. Um, I think the government's governance aspects around it and actually enabling some of these projects and token holders to govern what happens in these protocols, voting rights, etc. I think that's a really interesting concept. So I think that will play out and be advantageous to what's happening in this space. Okay. Well, thank you very much, guys. I think we arrived to the 20 minutes. Um, thank you for your expertise and uh, the nice chat we just had. Thanks very thank much. You. Thanks thank so much. you. Bye.